one in. All right, let's go to our next guest. We have uh, Kay Hanley from Letters to Cleo. Kay, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, you look fantastic. What are you talking, I did not know that this was on video and I've been like at work all day. And then it was like, oh, turn on your camera, so. You know, it's funny because all my guests are <laughs> with me every week, but nobody knew this was going to be video. Was, no matter how many times I told the other guests, because I didn't talk to you directly. Uh, but here we are. It's video. You look fantastic. What are you drinking? I'm drinking uh, a Pomplemousse LaCroix. Ooh. I'm, I'm patting really hard today. <laughs> well, you know, uh, times have changed, right? Things are different <laughs> than uh, 30 years ago. Just like talking about horror movies with my buddy. We I have to grow up sometimes. Poltergeist, which was like my yeah. my first scary movie. Was and it? I yeah. went to Puritan Cinema in Neponset and I uh, wow. saw it literally 10 times. And I was obsessed with Carol Ann. <laughs> did, now, did that turn you on to horror or was yeah. that enough for you? That one right there? No, no. no. I'm, so I'm not a horror person, uh, but I have seen over the pandemic um, because my son's a real horror buff and uh, I have been forced to watch like Saw. Ooh. And uh, we also watched uh, one of my favorites. I don't know if it's, it's horror was uh, Mids Midsummer. That okay, so that's gonna stick with me forever. My wife was in the hospital, forever. and while she was uh, recovering from what we were going through, I sat and watched that movie. And that's uh, I watched that movie while she was sleeping, and I don't think I'll ever get over how traumatizing that movie is. It's such a weird oh vibe God. through the whole thing. The whole thing, it's so nuts. The thing at the end, well, where she's like covered in flowers and then they bring the poor guy in the bear suit into the room where they're all going on fire and you know that he's like the drug that he took he's in there like he's yeah. completely aware but he can't talk or communicate and yeah. as, and he's inside the bear suit and as the flames go up oh my god it's it's weird right that in a, a mother was another movie that came out around the same time that was an acid trip as well anyway <laughs> Yeah, those two movies. It's funny how I, I can, uh, um, I, I, I don't know, I can picture where I was and what I was doing. And, yeah. and I don't like that. Actually, I don't like that. I don't like talking about a time in my life and then being reminded of something else that was horrible. Sure. You know what I, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, okay, let's get on topic here. Hot <laughs> Snow <Stone laughs> is, uh, is coming up on May 18th. It's virtual this year, but you've been a part of this for a long time. How'd you get involved? Um, well... Uh, Jeff Horrigan, who was, uh, he was a Red Sox notebook writer for the Boston Herald at the time. This was tw uh, year 2000. And um, we were friends with uh, Peter Gammons. And Gammons wanted to start like a, he wanted to have a fundraiser, like all the other sports people had their fundraiser. They all had their like golf tournaments and stuff. Mm. And Gammons is a big rock fan. He didn't want to do that. He was like, why don't we just have a concert? And, uh, and they, called, they called me and they were like, hey, you want to do a fundraising concert for Gammons? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? What, what, what do you want to do? Six weeks at the Paradise, six weeks from now at the Paradise. I was like, you guys, we're, we're never going <laughs> to. Yeah. It was now like, at this, at this point, were you. Picture. At this point, um, you weren't with Letters to Cleo. That the band had disbanded at that point, right? We had just kind of disbanded, and okay. you know, had like a new baby, and you know, and you know, so we weren't really doing very much. But um, but I was getting ready to release a solo record, or maybe I was in the middle of making my first solo record, and uh, but I was like, you guys, we can't just book the Paradise for six weeks from now and have people be there. Yeah. And uh and they were like, ah, who cares? And I was like, all right, let's let's go. So they put together like this auction, like, you know, it's gammon. So people will, you know, everyone loves him. So all the sports people gave him memorabilia and uh, you know, we put together a show and it, there were a ton of people there and um some very mis oh, no. just not cool person just walked by my window. All right, well, stay with me, okay. Right. Well, you'll be here when yes. you come back to murder me. It will all I, be on your show. So <laughs> that's high ratings. I'm gonna get high ratings for this. Yeah. So, so 
at that event, the first one raised $25,000. And I was like, well, we're never going to, I mean, I was blown away. I was like, well, I'm never going to beat that. Right. Mm. And, um, and then a couple of years later when, you know, we did it the next year and the next year. And then I think in 2003, when uh, Theo came to Red Sox um, and they brought on board Elise and Jimmy um, to be like, that, that was when we grew up and that's when the, the foundation became the umbrella that we raised money for. We started the Gammon Scholars and, um, and then we started raising some real money and getting some real people to, to be involved. Um, but it's always been, it's always felt like a very local event. And of course now we do one in Chicago and mm. um, yeah, so it's just been, it's just been such a trip. This is our 21st, our 21st event. Wow. That's fantastic. Um, you, so you grew up in Massachusetts and you're a, you're a Red Sox fan, you're a Patriots fan. And uh, was it a trip sharing the stage with people like Bronson Arroyo? And uh, I can't think of it, uh, but I know a lot of players will get up and play a little Bronson had his own band for a long time. Yeah. Probably still does, but that, that must've been a trip for you. And so did Theo. And like, yeah, you know, that's right. Theo, when Theo for the first year he played, he wasn't there as like the, you know, the head of the foundation to be named later. He was there as the guitar player of a band called Trouser. So like his first year was him being on stage. And that's kind of the, one of the most, joyful things for me about the event is that it's all these people who like the baseball players and writers and people who, you know, like Wick from the Celtics is playing this year. And like just watching people who do other things get on stage and play, like they're not pros at music um, and are just so psyched. And I love seeing that because I've been yeah. doing for a long time so for me it's just like another day at the office but when you see someone like you know strap on like seeing gammon strap on a guitar like i still can't get over it i just love it what do you get nervous about because it's funny i do a morning show and i i i'm a, a musician myself or i'm a singer so all my friends who are watching that are musicians are like you're just a singer anyway so i i, I have no problem getting on i'm sorry <laughs> I have no problem getting on stage. I have no problem getting on the microphone in the morning. But for some reason, when I turn this thing on every Friday night, I, there's a pit in my stomach and I, I, I get weird. What, what do you get scared about? You're a performer. You're used to this. But what, what makes you nervous? That, that actually still does. Like having a show, especially when we go back to Boston and do shows in November, um, I've never gotten over just like that sick feeling of like, oh my God, I can't. And I I, I like never remember, I, I, I'm unable to like recall that like, I I do this all the time. I've been doing this since high school. Yeah. Every single time I do it, it's just like, I'm never gonna pull this off. They're never gonna buy it, you know? <laughs> so there's that. And then I can't think of other things that scare me. I think I'm just, you know, I do a lot of stuff uh, before I know I'm supposed to be afraid to do it, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to do it. Just go yeah. do it. And then after you're like, how did I do that? that was, exactly. Normally it would terrorize me. <laughs> uh, talk, okay. So what do you enjoy better do, uh, doing more? Do you enjoy uh, being on stage, rocking it out or, or rocking it out on a, uh, on a film set? Because you've done a few things. Mm -hmm. I was just watching 10 things I hate about you. Cause knowing that you had a few songs in there. Yeah. Um, I remembered how much I really enjoy that movie. So I put it on today. You've got three songs on that soundtrack. Yeah. 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 Did you, so do you enjoy spending more time on the stage or on a sound stage? Uh, definitely. I mean, my, my job now is I write songs for cartoons. That's what I do for my job. And I, I love being able to write songs that are not for me. And I, and I do love, I love film sets. I love TV sets. I love, cause it's so far, it's sort of like adjacent to what I do. It's like mm. entertainment business, but like, it's not, it's not my lane. So yeah. like, I'm just kind of like <sighs> in awe of everything. Like I'm, I have, I'm, I've always been starstruck by stuff well, like that. And you can also do another take. Whereas when you're doing a live show, whatever you say and do is happening in the moment. You can't go back and fix a lyric that you blew. 
No, no. And especially <laughs> now that everybody's like pointing their camera, you know, their phones at you. Oh, the yeah. It's like you can't get away with what I used to be able to get away with. You know, so you were part of the uh, Pawnee Eagleton Unity concert. Uh, sure Parks, <laughs> that's that's an honor. Yeah. Um, Parks and Rec is one of my favorite shows of all time. And to see you on that was was very exciting. I want to know if Adam Scott was as much of a fan as his character was, because I got the sense it was all put together because somebody on the set, if not Adam, suggested you because they were such a big fan. How did that work out? Funnily enough, this all comes back to Hot Stove. Okay. Because um, one year, so I forget how he ended up there, but Mike Shore, who uh, is now the sh was the showrunner of yep. Parks and Rec, years before that, he came to a hot stove with maybe like um, Janovitz, maybe or O'Malls. I don't know who, but he was he came, and I, you know, I'm this was when I was living in Boston, and. And uh, and he was like, you know, he was a Boston guy who had moved to L.A. and we were introduced thusly and uh, and he was a fan of Cleo. And so years and years later, um, <laughs> it was it was really funny. Someone someone texted me and was like, Cleo is trending on Twitter. And I was like, what? What? And like, I, I was like, okay, so I went to Twitter and discovered that Adam Scott was wearing a Letters to Cleo shirt. There's, and there it is. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> That's amazing. So, um, <laughs> so it turns out that Mike Shore had decided, you know, it was like he was when Adam Scott was going through his sort of like de depressive phase. Um, Mike Shore, the showrunner, was like, who, you know, I, he wanted him to be wearing, you know, for his depression phase, be wearing like a band t-shirt. And like it, he, he just thought that letters to Cleo was the perk. Cause we weren't so famous that it would be obvious, but we were just well known enough that people would be yeah. like, Oh, that's good. You know? <laughs> so, um, so that happened. And then he kept wearing it like multiple episodes. He kept wearing it. And, um, and then for that season finale for uh, the Pawnee unity concert, they asked if we would come play and yeah. So that's how it happened. Mike Shore, thank you. Did you spend more time on the set playing to the kid? Because the whole cast was there for this yeah. episode. Everybody from uh, Parks and Rec was there. And I can yeah. only imagine that when filming was done, you probably did a, a little bit extra, maybe put on a little bit more of a show. Um, I don't remember. I mean, TV schedules are so like, it's so they're just like checking a list. Like there's yeah. no dicking around with the schedule on 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 a TV show. Um, mm -hmm. So there was, but we did all you know. Like you get there, you get to the set at like you know six in the morning for hair and makeup, and then you go to breakfast and you kind of hang out with everybody all day. And I remember we got there and um, I saw Jeff Tweedy from Will. Now I'm like the most massive Wilco fan. And so I see Jeff Tweedy getting coffee at breakfast and I'm just like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> like what I have to say. Hi. Anyway, so that was at like eight in the morning. It wasn't until, not, and I, I tormented myself all day with how am I gonna just like work up the courage to say something to Jeff Tweedy. And You're Kay Hanley. Why couldn't you just walk up and say hi to him? I'm sure he knew who you were. I, he didn't seem to, and I don't know. I mean, I just, I'm my mother's daughter. I'm not like, <laughs> I just like, I don't, I'm not too big for my britches. I don't just assume that he knows who I am. And anyway, I was just fucking, oh, am I allowed to swear? Go right ahead. It's after hours. Terrified. So um, <laughs> it wasn't until nine o'clock that night when we were doing the song, the Pawnee song, the uh, Free Little Sebastian, that I finally made maybe Dave Gibbs or some, or, or Mark Rivers like walk me over and introduce me to Jeff Tweedy and he couldn't have been nicer. And I was just like, freak, like my heart is pounding just thinking about it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I didn't see the cat, but my friend Don is saying that she, uh, the cat's scared. You have a cat in the house? I oh, hope yeah. you have a cat in the house. Okay, good. Cause not only do you have a stranger at the door, you have a cat behind you. I do. And I have a dog yeah. on the floor. Just Oh, it. cute. And then I want to mention, um, and I want you to seriously, I want you to remember this name and when we're done, maybe give her a Google on Facebook or, uh, on our website. Jennifer Taft is an amazing rocker. 
Uh, much, okay, she Jennifer. reminds me, yeah, very much like you, but um, she's uh, she's still continuing to make music. Um, I think you'd really like her stuff. Give her a, a look up after we're done. Um, uh, let's talk about Bowling for Soup. You did a song with them. And Bowling for Soup is one of my favorite bands of all time. What was uh, what was your time spent with them like? They're crazy. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. Um, oh, you really threw me off there. Um, <laughs> I um, dug deep. I dug deep. Wow. So the song the song was um, I've never done anything mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, and it was off the uh, what was it? Gone fishing, going fishing. So I, I don't know. Fishing for woos. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Uh, no, there are, uh, you know, we, we traveled the same paths for, you know, our whole entire careers and, um, you know, they're friends with, uh, the Dolly Rots and I just love mm. the Dolly Rots. And so you wrote a song for them, didn't you? I did. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I just love them. They're just so great. So that there was like that kind of like community. They, um, you know, they were recording this song. They wanted a girl's vocal on it. So they were like, Hey, Kay, you want to slick on this? And I was like, sure. Why not? Is that how easy it can be from artist to artist? Yeah, yeah, definitely. De I mean, I that's, that. I ended, I sang on a Dropkick Murphy song like a million years ago and um, uh, called Dirty Glass. And the way that introduction came about was like, my dad was friends with Kenny and like Kenny Casey and like, and Kenny asked my dad if I would want to sing on this thing. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're talking about Boston and parts right. beyond, and yeah. we're talking about a band that has like 20 people in it. So yeah. chances are everybody knows somebody in the <laughs> in the exactly. Dropkick Murphys and yeah. the Mighty Mighty Bostones as well. True. I think everybody knows yeah. somebody. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's talk a little serious about your, and I, I don't know if you're still a part of the Songwriters of North America. Yeah. Um, you're co still the co-director? Yeah, director, yeah. Um, it's a serious, I have a lot of musician friends who are putting music out and they're writing original stuff. And I've done a lot of research on how some bands just get screwed. I mean, we all know the stories like the Beatles and Paul McCartney losing all of their songs to, uh, to Michael Jackson. Yeah. I can't fathom the idea of somebody writing something and then it just goes to someone else and that artist has no control and they're not making royalties. Right. Tell me what the, um, what the songwriters of North America do for the artist. Right, uh, I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, again, you're like throwing me for, I, I was not expecting you talking about- I'm this. all over the place. I know, I love it. What happens after um, a drink? I, <laughs> uh, so songwriters of North America, we are um, a nonprofit advocacy organization and we fight to protect the value of songs and songwriters in the streaming music marketplace. And, um, you know, there, there's, oh God, I don't even know where to start. I mean, artists and songwriters getting screwed is not a new story, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, you know, and even, you know, what you just mentioned about Michael Jackson buying the Beatles catalog, um, that was an artist screwing another artist. So that's like the other thing. That was Who just- were like, friends, by the way. And really, that was just really good business, you know? He, he Michael Jackson was a, what, say whatever you will, that was a mwah, business. Oh, yeah. Business. But in terms of like, you know, uh, labels, publishers, uh, and now streaming services, like it, we have, songwriters and, and recording artists have never been great advocates for themselves. You know, generally speaking, we want to either hide out in our studios or it's just like, we just want to write songs. We don't want to deal with this business stuff, you know? Mm. And, um, and for me, uh, early on, I remember thinking like, this is so much fun. I can't believe they're paying me for this. Like I, I worked a waitress job for years and was in the band like full on um, and never made any money. So this you is- You were just happy to get whatever you could get. So exactly. And then, but I carried that attitude with me for way longer than I should have mm. where, because what we do is skilled labor and what we own, we should be able to control. Um, even if we share the ownership of that with a label or a publisher, whatever it is, people should not be taking advantage the way they are. And now with streaming, you know, it's so complicated. I'm a fan of streaming. 
personally, I've never listened to more music or found more music in my life yeah, than I same have. Here. With stream, right? So we all know it's like incredibly convenient, and um, and the music business has never been more lucrative than it is now. Uh, there should there's plenty to go around. So um, what we do is try and work through legislation, through awareness. Um, you know, right now we have um, a, a campaign called Sexy Metadata Action Group to try and encourage songwriters to start registering, you know, start when they go into the studio. It, this is a very simple thing that can help you get paid. When mm -hmm. you go into the studio, who are you writing with? What are the splits? Write it all down. Make sure that you like send that to ASCAP or BMI so that like the start of the metadata of your song is correct. Um, we're all going to rely on our data. You know, clean data is valuable data. Yeah. If, if people can't find, if streaming services can't find you, you ain't going to get paid. So the best way to make sure that they can find you is to make sure that at the inception of that song, when you get to the studio, write down who's there, what's the title, you're going to split it 50, 50, you know, Oh, it's funny because I know a lot of ba bands don't want to talk about that stuff. I was, I, I've written, I've written about 20, 25 songs myself and with cool. other people, but yeah. I can remember sitting down and we're just saying, oh, the band's going to get this. We're not going to put writing credits on this. It's going to be by, uh, written by the Twitch. That's it. And, right. th and then when you look and nothing ever came of these songs, but right. if they had, there could have been some bad blood. Right. Cause I, cause I wrote all the lyrics. Maybe I should get more money. Well, that, that is, I mean, that, that is a, those are the uncomfortable conversations that yeah. should be happening in the room. And you're absolutely right. That's kind of why people don't do it. They don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation about like, well, I wrote more words than you. So I think I should get 60% and you should get 40%. My, my personal philosophy on this is that like, if you're in the room, you split it equally, you know? Okay. There, Everyone's there, you know, yeah. Everyone, if because if it's a huge banger and a smash all over the world, everyone's gonna get paid. Yeah. But if you ruin it by fighting over 5%, no one's gonna get paid. Yeah, I'd rather have I'd rather have a lower percentage of a big hit than a bigger percentage of a turd. Well, where can people get more information? I know there's a few local musicians that are watching right now. Where can they go to get more information about your your efforts? Well, as it happens, we are having our first awards show next Ooh, week. Okay. Um, and I'll send I'll send you I don't think I have your email address, but um it's uh that's gonna be on the twenty why am I spacing on this? Um I'll get back to you. Okay. It's, yeah. It's, it's we'll next, go through. Next, it's next Sunday night. Um, okay. But Songwriters of North America is at uh, wearesona.com. And uh, we're on social media. And, uh, you know, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on all the stuff. Everywhere. We're on MySpace and Friendster and all, all right. of and support a great cause. It's coming up on May 18th. It's virtual this year. Hot stove, cool music. I mean, we owe a lot to Theo for what he did yeah. in New England and in Boston. So let's uh, give back. And Peter Gammons is a great guy. Peter Gammons calls into our sports show on the radio station uh, often. So it's it, he's a part of our family at the radio station. Uh, it's just a great organization. And Theo and his brother are amazing. Yeah. Uh, real quick, Kay, before I let you go, where can we hear new stuff from you. I know you, you said you're working on cartoons. What can yep. we put on the TV right now and, and here? Um, well, um, Doc McStuffins, you know, that, that was, my, you know, we did all the music for that. So that's like my first love. Um, DC Superhero Girls on Ooh. Cartoon Network, we do all the music for that. Uh, upcoming, I'm so excited for Ada Twist Scientist on Netflix. I think that's coming out maybe end of the summer. Okay. And, um, and uh, I mean, those are the biggies right now. I also have, we have our own show and development at Disney called Kindergarten the Musical. So, um, but that, that's a cut. It, it, it takes a million years for animation to get made. So that's a few yeah. years away. 
And we can always go back on those streaming services and listen to the uh, the entire catalog of Letters to Cleo, your solo stuff, the soundtrack to 10 Things I Hate About You. Actually, this morning on my radio show, I do an All Request Dance Party on Fridays, and I played I Want You to Want Me, which is a fantastic yes. cover. Yes. Oh, so I, I play it almost every other week. We um, can't forget Josie and the Pussycats. We just had our 20th anniversary of that movie and the soundtrack. Yeah, you did that the you now did on everything on there. Purposes for the first time. Oh, is it? Oh, awesome. Uh, Kay, thank you. It was a pleasure speaking to you. And let's uh, hopefully keep in touch. We'll do it again soon. I would love that, Ray. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.